The legacy of the British Empire remains still a controversial subject. The, uh, there are voices that uh, quite a lot of positive aspects uh, remained, such as the infrastructure, especially the railways. The English were always building railways in their colonies. The system of education, the system of justice, parliamentary democracy, the civil service, so the service of um, state administration, capitalist economy, the popularity of Protestantism and generally Christianity, but mostly the Protestant uh, religion, some British sports, which are not popular elsewhere, but in the former colonies are very, very popular, such as cricket or rugby, and of course the global popularity and domination of the English language. Um, another thing that remains and is often viewed as a positive legacy of the British Empire is the Commonwealth. The Commonwealth is an international organization grouping 52 former colonies, now independent states. Uh, this is a voluntary organization aimed at um, creating some sort of cultural ties, business ties. Britain uh, feels, they still feel they have the need to help and um, assist their former colonies. So um, they have their own Olympics called the Commonwealth Games. Uh, in which they have all those English sports. Uh, there is also quite a lot of cultural legacy in uh, theory of culture, theory of literature, uh, and they are more critical than uh, than uh, uh, these uh, uh, things which I uh, which I uh, enumerated um, a moment ago, because. Uh, the idea is really for the intellectuals to try to understand how the empire happened and how it worked and why the colonized people were really allowing that. So what we have is the study of post-colonialism, post-colonial studies as a field of culture studies, literature studies and uh, similar disciplines. So it is the, the study of the legacy of two things, colonialism and imperialism. These things are sometimes called as uh, synonyms to mean the same, but they are not exactly the same. Colonialism means extending and retaining the authority over territories and people for the benefit of the colonizing country. This is important, for the benefit of the colonizing country. And imperialism is a nation extending its power by acquisition of lands, by purchase, diplomacy or military force. So building an empire, building this kind of powerful um, country with one nation dominating over others. And uh, of course... Uh, the scholars, the intellectuals who started looking at the legacy of the of the British Empire in this way were uh, mostly the scholars uh, with the, um, the the personal histories in the colonized. Uh, nations, colonized peoples and their identity. Well, this is somehow understandable if you see that, um, that humanist studies lack the perspective of people like you, you want to remedy that. So um, they didn't have much good to say about the British Empire. So first of all, they started observing all kinds of uh, horrible things that happened during the imperial pe um, uh, um, period. Things like suppression, exploitation, humiliation, slavery, rape. So all the horrors that the colonizers um, um, committed against the people they colonized. Uh, they started using, these intellectuals, they started using the um, discourse of modern cultural studies, such as the other, othering, if you remember, uh, the um, uh, postmodern word. So creating binary oppositions, like contrasts to Western ideals. 
So the uh, native peoples would be savage, uncivilized, godless, stupid, naive, violent, sexually easy. So all the things that uh, the West would think as worse compared with their own values. So of course the colonizers would be civilized and God-fearing and wise and uh, mature and uh, moral. So all the things that the natives supposedly in the eyes of the colonizers were not. Um, so uh, the process of othering, rather peoples than people. People means individual human being. Peoples means ethnic groups. So people taken as some sort of groups. Uh, this could be used against, of course, uh, as uh, you can see in this uh, photograph, African slaves and uh, generally black people. But not only, not only. You do not have to be exotic to be othered for uh, propaganda reasons. For example, here we have three posters from the, uh, from the 1930s, so before the Second World War, using the techniques of othering against the nations or groups who were considered to be the enemy, such as the Japanese for the Americans, the Germans for the English, or in the middle, the Jews for the Russians. And uh, every time the, the enemy is seen as dangerous, as less than human, as brutal, sometimes as not human at all, as this German is uh, seen as a, as a gorilla, as a kind of ape, a King Kong. Very often we have the innocent victim. Uh, a young woman here in the case of this anti-Japanese and anti-German propaganda or even a pile of human skulls in the central uh, poster against the Jews made in, in Russia. So as you can see, you just need to point who is the enemy and uh, um, then you can use the techniques of othering against uh, these groups. groups rather than individual people. Uh, now a few names of the scholars uh, who uh, really said something um, interesting and innovative in, uh, in post-colonial studies. Probably the most famous and the most influential of them would be Edward Said. He was born in British-occupied Jerusalem in what he called an Arab Christian family and his most famous book um, published first in the 70s was called Orientalism. It was about how the Western world perceives the Orient. The Orient meaning the, uh, the Middle East, the Near East, so places, the Arab countries basically. Uh, and um, what Said observed was that uh, um, in the novels, in the art of the Western world, uh, especially in the 19th century, uh, there is something interesting happening, something uh, quite systematic. So, uh, first of all, the Middle East uh, was um, orientalized, it means it was romanticized, it was presented as beautiful and exotic and, and fascinating and sexy. Uh, if you read the novels set in the Middle East, if you watch uh, paintings um, set in the Middle East, uh, they all show a very romanticized image of the Orient, but at the same time it is showed as weak, as irrational, feminized. We have the image of a beautiful uh, girl in the harem. So this is, this is the, like, the entire Orient. She is beautiful, she is exotic, she is sexy, but at the same, at the same time uh, irrational, weak and in need of protection. And the man of the Orient would also be fascinating and exotic and um, 
also very sexually attractive, but at the same time very often brutal and uncivilized and also in the need of policing, in need of control rather than uh, protection. This is, this is really Orientalism and if you look at the traditional, the typical stereotypes really of, uh, of uh, showing the Middle East here you have it. Another name, Gayatri Chakravorty Spivak, uh, a scholar born in Calcutta in India and she wrote a very famous um, article called Can the Subaltern Speak? She uses the word subaltern which is borrowed from Antonio Gramsci whom you know already and it means people outside of the hegemonic power structure of the colony. And what um, Gayatri Spivak um, observed was that colonized people are denied the right to discuss and analyze their own culture. So the cultural perspective, the ideology behind um, cultural studies does not allow for the point of view of people from the colonized minorities or colonized uh, um, groups. So uh, this was a new perspective. Of course not all of the scholars who, who deal with post-colonialism have this sort of ethnic background. Many do because this is their perspective but uh, of course not all of them. Two more names and two more uh, names of, uh, of scholars with some sort of ethnic background. So Homi Baba born in Mumbai in India and uh, his main book was called The Location of Culture from the 90s and uh, he speaks about three aspects of culture hybridity which means new cultural forms emerging from multiculturalism so uh, he, he works in, uh, in Britain mostly so uh, in the modern postmodern multicultural society so he tries to observe how other perspectives than the western perspective enter the mainstream and enter the popular culture so ambivalence culture consists of opposing conceptions and dimensions so it's always a kind of tension it's always a kind of discussion and mimicry and here we have a photograph of what uh, Homi Baba would call a uh, mimic man, or to use an Indian word, a babu. So an Indian native man in the colony, mostly in the 19th century, who tried to be more English than the English. So uh, the Indian, mostly middle class man, who wanted to obtain higher education, who dressed in the Western uh, fashion, who wanted to have um, uh, the uh, jobs in colonial administration and very often they spoke the language perfectly, they knew a lot about British culture, history, literature, poetry, they could quote these things better than the English um, to the point that they were ashamed of their own culture but uh, it never really allowed them to go to the top, let's say, of the career in administration because uh, even the, um, the English people uh, with less qualifications would get the, higher, the highest jobs. So it's, uh, it's really a sad story. Um, of uh, some of the people in the colonies, especially in India, as I said, who tried to uh, follow the rules of the colonizers to, um, to win in fair fight of intellect and education and it wasn't really possible and uh, Homi Baba tries to ex explore why. And the last scholar, Stuart Hall, he was born in Jamaica, he also uh, worked in Britain, he was one of the founders of the Birmingham School of, of Cultural Studies, so he, is, he was, because he died a few years ago, he was mostly interested in popular culture and modern media uh, and uh, in reception theory, so the meaning, the encoding and the decoding of cultural meanings. So. Um, Things like uh, that the message relies on social context, uh, 
that it's all about negotiation, tension, resistance. So uh, he worked together with Homi Baba quite a lot. Uh, and also the construction of prejudice in popular culture and media. So as you can see, these are mostly uh, the voices of the uh, scholars um, uh, who are descended from formerly colonized peoples. Uh, but uh, I guess it's still important, especially in Britain, but not, all, not only, if you think about it, Poland in the 19th century used to be a colony of the neighboring powers. So do we have Polish post-colonialism? I leave it with this question and the last uh, part will deal with ecology. Thank you.